Okay. So um, today I will speak about stable stability and instability of some spectral inequality. Uh, and so let me start with an introduction to what means stability. And I will uh, give the, um, make reference to the recent result by Fusco Maggi Pratelli in 2008. So they proved a quantitative version of the, um, of the classical isoperimetric inequality, which reads as follows. So omega, it's a sub measurable subset in Rn of finite measure. So let me just say that now that I will speak only in the Euclidean space, R2 or Rn. And when I speak about volume, I refer to the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure. So the classical isoperimetric inequality states that the perimeter of omega is larger than or equal than the perimeter of the ball of the same measure. Now, you can make this inequality quantitative and the proof, uh, the result of Fusco Maggi Pratelli says that the difference between the perimeter of omega and the perimeter of the ball is greater than or equal than some constant times the so-called Frankel asymmetry squared. And uh, this uh, notion of Frankel asymmetry, it's one way to measure the asymmetry of omega, of just a set, with respect to the ball. And is defined as follows. The asymmetry of uh, the Frankel asymmetry of the set omega is the infimum of the measure of, sorry, here is the symmetric difference between omega and the ball divided by the measure of omega. So the measure of the symmetric difference between omega and the ball divided by the measure of omega among all possible balls which are just translated and have the same measure of omega. So here I made a draw. You have omega and then you put the red ball in some best way such that you cover at most omega and the Frankel asymmetry will measure this uh, blue part here, which is the symmetric difference between omega and the ball. And uh, this um, quantitative isoperimetric inequality is sharp. So one cannot do better by somehow decreasing the power of the Frankel asymmetry, which is here too. And this uh, inequality, which is purely geometrical, involves perimeter and volume in Rn. In fact, it has a very long history. It started with Bernstein in, in 1905, and then Bones and Hadwiger, Fuglede, Hall, and so on, gave some sort of results which are not uh, sharp in the sense that either there were some constraints on the dimension or the topology simply connecting into dimensions or probably convex sets or eventually probably sets which have uh, symmetry upon all axes and so on or there was no, they were no sharp because there were higher powers than two. But nevertheless, this, has, this inequality has a long history and Hall uh, conjectured that the inequality would be true for the sharp exponent two. And uh, this is what the Fusco Maggi Pratelli proved in 2008. Later on, there were two different proofs of the same inequality. Another one by Figali, Maggi and Pratelli they gave a proof by, by mass transportation techniques. And another one, which was given by Cicalese and Leonardi, which is the proof of somehow new, different nature because it uses the selection principle. And this selection principle is something that I will refer a little bit later in my talk. So roughly speaking, instead of proving the inequality for every set omega, it is enough to prove the inequality only for some subsets, some, some special sets omega, which do satisfy some special properties. Okay. So now after the proof given by Fusco Maggi and Pratelli in 2008, there was some work trying to prove spectral inequalities involving the first eigenvalues of different operators, essentially the Laplace operator with different boundary conditions. In particular, the first result maybe was the result by Brasco and Pratelli in 2012, where uh, they proved that the uh, quantitative version of the Seger-Weinberger inequality, so involving the first uh, non-zero Neumann eigenvalue of the Laplacian. So roughly speaking, this is a maximization problem, the first eigenvalue on the ball minus the first eigenvalue of omega is larger than a constant. And again, we find here the symmetry squared. And this is sharp. There was another quantitative inequality involving the Steklov eigenvalue, but 
it was not the Weinstock inequality. It is what is called the Brock-Weinstein inequality because here one proves that the first non-zero stack of eigenvalue on the ball is larger than the first non-zero eigenvalue of omega with a volume constraint. Volume meaning, I repeat, the n-dimensional Lebesgue measure of the set, not the measure of the boundary, which is n minus one dimensional. And this was a result by Brasco, De Filippis, and Ruffini in 2012. And they again, they proved uh, this kind of inequality with the right-hand side uh, consisting on a constant, dimensional constant, times the Frankel asymmetry squared. So this is why I put here the term measure to power one over n, or, or here measure power two over n, just to make these quantity, quantities uh, scale invariant. And uh, I put these inequalities in green. Because as you see, both of them are somehow in the vein of the inequality of Fusco, Maggi, Pratelli. But nevertheless, they have a particularity. Both of them are maximization questions. So in both questions, you want to maximize, look for a maximal eigenvalue. And here, in both situations, you have the ball. And somehow, this problem is very, very different from the problem where you want to minimize the eigenvalue. Because for this kind of problems, is roughly speaking, enough to take test functions, which in general comes out from construction from the eigenfunctions onto the ball that you extend, and then somehow you get information from these test functions. So as you see, maybe the Dirac eigenvalue is most popular, but uh, the proof for the Dirac eigenvalue arrived later. And in fact, this problem has its own history. So, here, one wants to improve the faber kron inequality. Roughly speaking, you have domains in Rn, and you want to prove the lambda 1 of omega, the first Dirichlet eigenvalue of the Laplacian, minus lambda 1 of the ball is larger than a constant, and again, here, the asymmetry square. And they said that uh, this inequality has its own history, starting in maybe 92 with Melas, later on with Hansen Nadirashvili, where they proved uh, this inequality in some particular situations, either simply connected sets in two dimensions or convex sets, and here with different uh, asymmetry distance. Uh, but I mean, if you work with convex sets, uh, you can uh, more, more or less all the asymmetry distance are the same. And uh, after the proof of Fusco Maggi Pratelli of um, the quantitative form of the isoperimetric inequality, there was a new paper by Fusco Maggi and Pratelli in 2009 where they proved the quantitative version of uh, the Faber Kran inequality. Nevertheless, the power here was not optimal. The power here was maybe three in two dimensions and a little bit more in higher dimensions. So it was not sharp. And the proof um, came later in 2015 by Brasco, De Filippis, and Velichkov. And there are maybe two fundamental ideas that one has to, to mark uh, regarding the proof of Brasco, De Filippis, and Velichkov. So the first idea is that they wanted to prove uh, the quantitative uh, version of the faber kron inequality, but they proved first that it is enough to understand what happens to the torsional rigidity. So the torsional rigidity is like solving the problem the Laplace equation with the right hand side equal f equal to one. And they, uh, this was possible because there was an inequality by Collet Robin, which states that roughly speaking, when you minimize the first Dirac eigenvalue among sets with fixed torsional rigidity, then the minimum is against the ball. And this inequality is stronger than the Faber Kran one. So, first of all, one has to prove this. Uh, inequality only for the torsional rigidity. And if you prove for this, then you have a full range of semi-linear eigenvalues, which covers as well the classical uh, faber kron inequalities. This was the first idea. And there was a second idea, and this is crucial here because they used again the selection principle. And uh, how they used the selection principle? Again, they said, instead of proving the inequality for every set omega, they prove that it's enough to prove the inequality for sets which are somehow special. And for that, to find those special sets which have definite some good properties such that the inequality comes easier, they solved an auxiliary free boundary problem. And somehow in the talk to, of today, I will also follow this uh, in, in principle, this idea that if you want to prove an inequality in quantitative form of this kind, you have to solve an auxiliary problem. 
of free boundary type. And in 2017, there were two papers, two survey papers, one by Giroir and Polterovich, and another one by Brasco and Defilis. And Giroir and Polterovich made a survey, wrote a survey paper on the stack loss problem, and in particular, they raised the question of the stability of the first non-zero stack loss eigenvalue, but this time, in two dimensions among simply connected sets, but this time, this time with a perimeter constraint, not with a volume constraint, which would be area in two dimensions. So this is not the Brock version of the, of the inequality, but the original Weinstock version of the inequality. So this uh, was an open problem. And also in 2017, there was a survey paper uh, in the book uh, edited by Antoine Onro, by Brasco and De Filippis, and they uh, raised the question of uh, proving the stability of the bosel danners inequality. bosel danners inequality makes reference to the first eigenvalue of the Robin-Laplacian, of the Laplace with a operator with Robin boundary conditions. And um, then we worked uh, on this problem with uh, Ferron and Nietzsche and Trombetti, and we got some stability result. And later on, we continued with uh, my student, Michael Nau, on this question. And today I want to speak about these two problems. And uh, let me just uh, start with the Weinstock inequality and tell you what we have obtained. So the, the result I will give today were obtained jointly in different works with Michael Naun and with Alessandro Giacomini from Brescia. So let me start with the Weinstock inequality. So this is in two dimensions. Omega in R2 is a smooth simply connected set. And we look to the Steklov eigenvalues in omega. We solve minus Laplacian u equal to zero and du over dn equal to sigma u. Sigma is the eigenvalue and this equality occurs on the boundary. And Weinstock in 1954 proved this inequality that the product between the perimeter of omega times the first non-zero eigenvalue of the Steklov problem is less than or equal than two pi, two pi being the value obtained exactly on the disk. And he also proved that the disk is the only smooth, simply connected set which realizes uh, the maximum, which is two pi. And uh, the open question raised by Giroir and Polterovich made reference to the stability of this problem. So in other words, if you have a set omega which for which the quantity uh, perimeter times the eigenvalue is close to two pi, is it true or not that uh, the domain omega is closed to the disk? Uh, well, the proof, uh, this is a maximum problem. Again, the proof uh, of uh, Weinstock was based on some use, some very smart use of test functions. Uh, essentially the fun eigenfunctions onto the disk which were transplanted, transplanted on omega by conformal map. So this was the paper of Weinstein in 1954. And uh, we discovered with uh, Perone, Nietzsche and Trombetti a, a very interesting fact that it, this paper published by Weinstein succeeded a preprint, which was uh, written in 54. It was a reprint, a technical report in the Department of Mathematics of Stanford. And this uh, reprint, this preprint, sorry, had in fact two sections which do not appear in the paper published later in the journal. And uh, in those two sections, in fact, he analyzes convex sets in two dimensions. And uh, he proves this inequality, which holds for convex sets only. So he proved that two pi minus the product between uh, the perimeter and the stack log wagon value is larger than this quantity. Here you have the, the, the perimeter, here you have the momentum on the boundary. And here you have the difference between the support function and its average that you sum over the circle. And if you look to this, this inequality is always, is still, is already a quantitative, a quantitative one. Because if you know somehow that uh, you are close here, so this quantity, the perimeter times sigma one is close to two pi, then the right hand side has to be low which roughly speaking will tell you that the support function has to be very close to its average. So this is a stability result. Uh, but of course, this inequality is true only for convex sets. And in uh, 2019, last year, there was a paper 
by Gavitone Lamana, Paola and Trani from Napoli, where they proved a stability result for the Weinstock inequality in the case of X sets. So they proved that uh, if you stay into the class of two-dimensional convex sets, then you have this kind of inequality, two pi, which is the maximum, minus sigma one is larger than a constant times the Frankel asymmetry squared. And in n dimensions, still in the class of convex sets, you have this same kind of inequality, but the, um, the power which appears here on the right-hand side over the Frankel asymmetry is different and is uh, depending on the dimensions. And uh, those inequalities are sharp, but they, are, they hold true only in the class of convex sets. And now, uh, so this uh, what was done, and uh, we were working with Mikhail Naun on, um, on the Robin problem and with Alessandro Giacomini, and uh, we learned from Yosef that uh, for the Weinstock inequality in two dimensions, the stability problem is not, uh, is not uh, known. And then we said, okay, Robin is not so far from, from Weinstock, from Steklov, so let's try to see if uh, somehow the techniques that we use for Robin can be adapted to prove the stability for Weinstock. And in fact, uh, this is the work with Mikhail Nohn, we found something which uh, was surprising for us because we noticed, we observed that the Weinstock inequality is genuinely unstable. So it's definitely unstable. I don't know how to say it. And in fact, we, we proved the following result. So let omega be open, smooth, and simply connected. Then there exists a perturbation omega epsilon of omega, which satisfies the following uh, properties. So omega epsilon is itself smooth and simply connected. Omega epsilon converges, I put it here, uniformly to omega, we did explain, but this means that omega epsilon converges in a very, very nice way to omega. The perimeters of uh, all the sets of the perturbations are uniformly bounded. So you have here the draw, you have in black the set omega, and you have these oscillations. This is the set omega epsilon, and the amplitude of the oscillations go to zero. But the, and here is a surprise, the product between uh, the perimeter and the first non-zero Streklov eigenvalue goes to two pi. It means to the maximum value that you can expect into the class of, uh, of simply connected sets. Uh, so this is a, a, a result which definitely says that uh, the Weinstock inequality is unstable because this means that you can achieve almost the maximum value, which is two pi in, this, in his inequality in the neighborhood of every omega or on every smooth simply connected set omega. So every sequence in red like this would be as close as we want uh, at, to two pi. And here are the oscillations. Sorry, I will, I will not detail how we built the oscillation, but just let me tell you that these oscillations will have the amplitude which will go to zero and will collapse over the boundary of omega, but the ratio between the height and the width is controlled from above. So this gives that the perimeters are uniformly bounded. So this is the result. And uh, let me in, in just try to give some, uh, some ideas uh, of, of the proof without entering into details. Um, so the first of all, there is a sort of lemma, a geometric perturbation result, which roughly speaking says the following. If we have a domain omega, which is smooth, simply connected, open of course, and the perturbation called here omega epsilon, which has the following properties. So omega epsilon satisfies a uniform count condition. So this is a uniform count condition, that's omega. Uniform count condition means that you do not allow the boundary of omega to make cusps in a sort of uniform way. What means uniform? So here, this is the cone in red, which is, has uniform size. And this is the neighborhood, a neighborhood of a point of the boundary, which is a disk and which again is of fixed size. And the omega satisfies the uniform cone condition if for every point you can put this boundary of fixed size such that in every point of the 
omega intersect with the domain or its complement, you can put a cone with the vertex in the point and which lies into the complement. So this is uh, the uniform cone condition. So I'm coming back. So omega was a smooth, simply connected set. Omega epsilon, it's an open perturbation of uh, omega, which satisfies this uh, uniform cone condition. The boundaries converge into the Hausdorff metric to the boundary of omega. Roughly speaking, this means that those oscillations collapse onto the boundary of omega. And when collapsing, nobody guarantees that the perimeter is preserved. So I'm looking to the Hausdorff measure, one dimensional Hausdorff measure restricted onto the boundary of omega epsilon. And we assume that this converge in, weak, in the weak sense of measures to a measure which is supported by the boundary of omega, which will be the product between a density function theta and, uh, and um, the, the Hausdorff measure on the boundary of omega. So these are the assumptions. Uh, then we can prove that uh, the spectrum, the Steklov spectrum over omega epsilon converges eigenvalue by eigenvalue to the spectrum over omega, but with a density theta which appears here. So this theta, which is only the accumulation of the perimeter over the boundaries, over the oscillating boundaries, appears into the limit Steklov problem. And I also made a draw showing how uh, this can occur, for instance. So you see here, you, I have a fixed part, a set with a fixed part of the boundary. And on the upper part, I have oscillations. But I take oscillations which are uniform in the sense that if you see the gradient of each side is in absolute value equal to one. So I have only 45 degrees. So I decrease the amplitude of the oscillation, so the periodicity increases. But still, if you look to the perimeter of this new boundary, it will be exactly the perimeter of this original boundary. And the same here, because I still keep the, the value of the angles to be 45 degrees. And when the amplitude goes to zero, one can easily check that uh, the perimeter here gives a density which will be exactly square root of two on this side. And on the other side, it will be still one. So this is the phenomenon that we expect uh, in this kind of uh, convergence here of omega epsilon, which uh, is oscillating and which converges in this way to, to omega, accumulating the perimeter theta onto the boundary. And then we prove that the spectrum converges. The proof is not complicated. Maybe there is only one technical point which I summarize here. So in this convergence with oscillating boundaries, one has to be careful only to the following fact, that uh, as soon as you have a sequence of functions, u epsilon, which belong to the Sobolev space H1 of R2, which converge weakly to some function u, then we want that uh, the sum of u square, epsilon square over the oscillating boundaries converge to the sum of u squared multiplied by theta over the limit boundary. So this is, this is a, sort, a sort of reinforced uh, trace theorem with the difference that you have oscillating boundaries and weakly convergent sequences in H1. So I would say that this is the main technical point to prove the, the result of stability of Steklov eigenvalues or convergence towards the problem with, uh, with density theta. And now, there is an observation which just says that, okay, we have this uh, perturbation result, we just keep it apart. And then we observe the following. We take a, si a simply connected smooth open set omega. So it's smooth, it's very important here. We take the disk and we take a conformal mapping G from the disk over omega. And now we want to just to see what become the Steklov eigenvalue problem over the disk when we transplant it over omega. And in fact, it's a very simple computation by integration, uh, by change of variables. And one can observe that uh, in fact, the Steklov eigenvalues here are exactly equal to the Steklov eigenvalues with a density theta, which is given by one over the modulus of G prime at the boundary. 
So we take the conformal mapping, everything is smooth. So we have extension of the conformal mapping up to the boundary and we compute theta, which is, which is one over G prime. And then by just uh, integration and uh, change of variables, we have this equality here. So the kth eigenvalue of the Steckloff problem on omega with theta density equals to the kth eigenvalue over the disk. So that's very easy. But now this gives the idea because on the one hand, we have this equality here. And on the other hand, from the previous result, we know that this kind of quantity can be approximated by a sequence of omega epsilon where we look to the real Steckloff problem. I mean, not to the density one. And so we have a sort of triangle of approximation. Sigma k of omega epsilon will approach this quantity, which is, by the way, equal to sigma k over the disk. And now this is the point. The, so this is what we want to do, but uh, maybe the technical part is to prove that as soon as we are given a open, smooth, bounded, and simply connected set omega in R2, and as soon as we give a continuous function theta defined over the boundary of omega, theta will be exactly one over the modulus, the absolute value of G prime, the modulus of G prime, then there exists a perturbation, omega epsilon, satisfying the conditions into the, into the perturbation theorem. Namely, we want that the boundaries converge to the boundary of omega into the Hausdorff metric. We want to keep the uniform cone condition along this convergence. And we want also the weak star convergence of the boundary measures of H1 over the boundary of omega epsilon towards the density theta times the, the Hausdorff measure of on the boundary of omega. So now, this can be done. This, this is what we have done with the Mikhail Nau. And uh, roughly speaking, uh, one can imagine that exactly the draw I made with the 45 angles, because this uh, gives you how to reach the constant square root of two. So roughly speaking, you can imagine that if you approach first theta by a piecewise constant function, then each constant part, you made suitable oscillation with correct angles to arrive to the constant. And then by a sort of diagonalization process, you arrive to, to, to this convergence to theta. And uh, also within these processes, we keep constant the angles of 45 degrees in the example I gave you before, the uniform co-condition will occur. So we have all, all, uh, all the, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, hypothesis satisfied. And now we are done because with this set, uh, sequence of sets omega epsilon, we arrive to approach the spectrum first over omega with density theta, but as theta is particularly chosen to be one over G prime, then this will be equal to the to sigma K of D. So we have this convergence. For this perturbation that we build around omega, we have convergence of the eigenvalues towards the eigenvalues of the disk. Now, of course, it remains uh, the, the perimeter part because we want to have convergence of the perimeter normalized eigenvalues, not all the, of the eigenvalues alone. So we have, we have just to look to the perimeter and the perimeter of omega epsilon is nothing else that uh, the integral over the boundary of the constant function one. And in view of the weak star convergence of the Hausdorff measure restricted to the boundary of omega epsilon to theta, we have this convergence here. And theta was exactly one over the modulus of G prime. So this will be equal to the, the perimeter of the disk, which is two pi. So in other words, we have proved uh, exactly what we wanted, namely that in the neighborhood of omega, which was any smooth simply connect set, we can build the sequence omega epsilon oscillating, but still simply connected such that the product between uh, the eigenvalues and the perimeter converge to the same quantity onto the disk. So this proves that, um, that uh, the, um, the Weinstock inequality is unstable. And uh, moreover, we have noticed the following result, which uh, we find found quite strange. So um, if we are given two sets, omega and small omega, let's say capital omega and small omega, 
which are both smooth and simply connected, then we can find a perturbation of capital omega, omega epsilon, as before, with uniformly bounded perimeter, omega epsilon are simply connected, such that omega epsilon converges to omega in the Hausdorff metric or L1 or many senses, and such that the perimeter normalized eigenvalues of uh, omega epsilon converge to the perimeter normalized eigenvalues of small omega, so of, to the other set. So starting from uh, a set omega, we can make a perturbation of omega and all the eigenvalues will converge to the eigenvalues of another set. And uh, this result remains true uh, if uh, omega, capital omega, capital omega and small omega are conformal. And in this case, uh, the sets will be homeomorphic to omega, not conformal. And this result, in fact, was also obtained uh, by different uh, manner, making small holes by uh, Giroir, Lagasse, and Karpukin very recently. So, and this was very surprising to us. And then we said, okay, but are we able to prove some, some stability result, uh, at least uh, to recover the case of convex sets, because we knew stability occurs in the class of convex sets. And in fact, we obtained with Mikael now some stability result. Uh, we didn't recover the case of convex sets because this result is of somehow of different nature. So in fact, we can prove that we have stability in terms of uh, what happens with a suitable conformal mapping associated to omega. So in a, some small class, some small class of sets, omega, for which there exist conformal mappings J such that this inequality holds true. So it's a C0 alpha norm of the logarithm of the modulus of G prime that has to be bounded with alpha and K fixed, alpha and K fixed, alpha strictly positive. Then we have this uh, stability result. There exists a constant which depends on the constant K here and on alpha here, such that the difference between sigma one of the disk and sigma one of omega with the same perimeter is greater than or equal than a constant. And here you have the house of distance between omega and the disk to some power. So we do not know whether this power is sharp, uh, but what we know is that we cannot make alpha equal to zero. So we, this is true for every strictly positive alpha and this falls if we have here a bound in C0 of the derivative of G. Uh, so this is what we, we, we got a stability result. Unfortunately, this doesn't, uh, this doesn't cover the convex case, for instance. So it's a different kind of stability. It allows oscillations, but uh, does not accept angles. So one has to maybe to work a little bit more to, to get a better stability result. Here. So this is what I wanted to say about, uh, about the Weinstock inequality. And now, I want to, to, to speak a little bit about the Robin problem. And uh, in fact, we were, were working on Robin when we arrived on Weinstock because what is Robin? It's not so far from Weinstock. So let, let me introduce the problem. So for beta strictly positive, which is here a parameter, it's called elasticity parameter. Omega is a subset of Rn, which is bounded in Lipschitz. So the Robin eigenvalue problem on omega solves is minus Laplace nu equal to lambda u in omega and the Robin boundary condition, which is here, d over dn plus beta u is zero over the boundary. And uh, so I say this is somehow related to Steklov, at least in the following way. So as beta is a fixed number, it's a parameter, you can uh, you somehow can move beta, you can perturbate beta and you this way you perturb the eigenvalue. And then if you go with beta into the negative sign, the eigenvalues do move continuously with beta. At some point you arrive that this value is zero. And the question is when you arrive that this is zero, you will solve minus Laplace nu equal to zero. And here d over dn plus the specific value you found of beta u equal to zero. But this is nothing else than the, sec the stack of eigenvalue. So, we were working on that and let me just now introduce uh, the Robin problem. So to find the first eigenvalue of uh, the Laplace operator with Robin boundary condition, 
we solve, we minimize the Rayleigh quotient associated with the lambda one of omega, which is here. We minimize over u in h one of omega, the L2 norm squared of the gradient over omega plus beta integral over omega of u squared. So we have a boundary energy times the parameter beta divided by integral of omega of u squared. So there are good properties of the first uh, eigenvalue. In particular, the first eigenfunction uh, of the Robin Laplace has constant sign. But definitely, and I made here a draw, definitely u is not zero at the boundary. So at least on a smooth boundary, one can prove easily that u has to be strictly positive at the boundary because of the Hopf principle. And the, here I made a draw trying to search a sort of intuition on how you can imagine uh, the action of a Robin boundary condition. So imagine that your set omega is here and all along the boundary, you have springs in red. And those springs are uniformly distributed along the boundary. And then you take the membrane and instead of gluing it here to get directly boundary condition at zero, you link the membrane to those springs and then you push with in upper, let's say in the upper sense with a force, with a positive force, and then the membrane will go up. Because the springs uh, a priori will let the membrane to go a little bit up. Nevertheless, if the boundary here would be somehow oscillating, imagine that instead of having this nice boundary, you have a sort of oscillating. As the springs are distributing uniformly along with the length, then in this region, you would have many more springs. And when you have many more springs, then the membrane will be stronger pulled down on that region. So this makes that there is a sort of asymmetry depending on, uh, on the geometry of omega. And uh, this will tell you definitely that the membrane a priori is not uh, constant even at the bond. In particular case of the ball, it turns out that the first eigenfunction is radially symmetric and is so constant at the boundary. But in general, it is not at all like this. Okay, so, so uh, and let me push a little bit further this uh, Rayleigh quotient by looking also to what are called semilinear eigenvalues of the Dirichlet Laplacian. So instead of considering uh, to the denominator the L2 norm, we consider this uh, power Q with a Q which is a number greater than or equal to one. In particular, if Q equals to one exactly, if Q, Q equals one, this solving this Rayleigh quotient comes out to solve the so-called torsional rigidity problem in which you, in fact, you are dealing with the problem minus Laplace and U equal to one in omega with Robin boundary condition. And there is a sort of analogous of uh, the, um, the faber cronin inequality in the Dirichlet case, which is due to Saint-Venant, which, uh, which says that uh, the torsional rigidity is maximal on two balls, on balls if you prescribe among sets of prescribed measure, or this quantity for Q equal to one would be one over the torsional rigidity, which is minimal on balls. So, the target now is to understand this kind of uh, inequality of, let's say, faber cron inequality for, for Q. And in fact, uh, this uh, inequality for Robin boundary condition has a history. The inequality was proved in the case Q equal to, so for the right eigenvalue, so for the eigenvalue problem, in two steps by Bossel and Danners. Bossel in 86 in two dimensions and Danners in 2005 in n dimensions in the class of Lipschitz sets. And uh, they used, I put it here in red, in the proof, the H function. I, next slide, the next slide will be with the H function. I will tell you what it is, the H function. So they, the, the proof is really amazing. So there is this, kind, this H function, which somehow captures the behavior of the eigenvalue and uh, they use it in a very, very smart way to, 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 to prove the inequality in the case Q equal to. Then in 2012, there was a, a paper by Bandel and Wagner where they worked on the torsional rigidity, namely the case Q equal to one for the, for the Robin boundary conditions. And they proved that uh, the ball, it's a local minimizer 
So only local means in terms of local pertur smooth perturbations, which are very small around the ball. And also they notice a very important fact. So there is no H function. So as soon as you try to prove the inequality for lambda one K Q, but not, so this is lambda one Q, but not for Q equal to a function, an H function. So a similar proof as the one of Boston and Danners seems at least, it seems not to, to exist. In 2015, with Giacomini, we gave a proof for a range of Qs from one to two n over n minus one, which is below the Sobolev critical exponent. And we gave a proof by free discontinuity approach. I will have also two slides on that and I will describe it. And there was a surprising result by Alvino Nietzsche and Trombetti last year, where for by again a completely different method, they have a Talenti approach. They prove a sort of similar theorem to the one of Talenti for Dirichlet boundary conditions. So they rearrange not the function, but the right hand side of the equation. And they are able to compare uh, the solutions. And this works to give a proof for Q equal to one in n dimensions and for Q equal to two in two dimensions. So for now, it seems uh, quite difficult to, to prove the inequality for eigenvalues in higher dimensions than two. Nevertheless, this uh, approach has a very, very interesting new feature because they get information also on the N infinity norms of the torsion function within the, this proce procedure. Okay, so let me, I had two, uh, three slides to tell you what is the H function and what is the free discontinuity approach. So, the proof of Bosel and Danners is based on the, on the analysis of this H function, which is associated to a domain omega. So to every omega, one associates this uh, quantity here, which is composed, I will not describe it in detail, but just tell me the, I will tell you the ingredients. So here UT, it's a level set of, uh, of the eigenfunction over omega. Phi is just any positive function, and you have these three ingredients. Here it's a sum over the internal part of the boundary of the level set. You have a sum over the external part of the level set and you have a sum over the level set UT. So what is important with these three terms is there is no derivative inside. So one associates to every level set, to every positive function, this quantity. And now it's difficult to put in one slide the full proof, which is, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, delicate. Uh, so, but I, I, I just can summarize like this. So here is uh, what can, one, one should do. So you start with lambda on omega and this is the crucial step in the proof. They say there exists some level set T such that the inequality lambda on omega is larger than the H function over UT with the function five is true for every function phi, but this level T is unknown and depends on the function. So there is a level T such that this inequality in blue here is true. And then they apply this inequality to the function starting from the ball, which is the norm of the gradient of the eigenfunction of the ball divided by the eigenfunction of the ball, which is dearranged on the level sets of the eigenfunction over omega. So this phi here, it's a dearrangement of this function. Now, this is the crucial inequality. This inequality is very easy because you see here, the three terms are all integrals. There is no derivative. And this is a consequence of the classical isoperimetric inequality. So this inequality is quite easy. And the last equality when you are on the ball is just a matter of integration. So it's, it's easy. The difficult part is this part here where you don't manage really the level set UT. So that's the proof. And a similar function to this one was not found to work for the torsion problem or any other Q. Now, what is the variational approach we had with uh, Giacomini? So it somehow, it sounds somehow unnatural because we want to transform the minimization problem into a free boundary problem. Only that in this case, we have jumps. And the crucial idea is to observe that if we start with a Lipschitz set with an eigenfunction over the Lipschitz set in omega, the eigenfunction will be positive at the boundary, 
but we still extend it by zero outside. So the function will have jumps at the boundary of omega. And it seems very unnatural to work with functions which are good, and then you have jumps seen globally in Rn. But in fact, those functions are not that bad. They are not that bad because if you look globally, in the sense of distribution to the gradient of u squared, you observe that the distributional gradient is here and decomposes in a very nice way. It's the absolutely part of the gradient of u squared here and here where it's zero times a jump part, which corresponds to the boundary and which is uh, supported by the boundary. And this will tell us that in fact u square, it's a special function of bounded variation. This is a subspace in BV, which was invented by the Georgian D'Ambrosio in the late 80s to, to deal with a Manfred-Schach function. And well, what we can do with this, we transform the original problem, which is the minimization of lambda one, one Q of omega with a volume constraint. We just replaced lambda one Q by its Rayleigh quotient here, you see? And then the two mean mean here, mean over sets of prescribed measure, mean over functions which belong to H1, we put all this together and instead we see only one function, one function which has jumps. And the notion of domain is in fact included inside the function U. The domain omega will be the set where U is non-zero. And in this way, this problem becomes this free bound, free boundary problem with jumps, which is called free discontinuity problem. So we work, we minimize among all functions U which belong to this SBV space in Rn. The constraint on the measure over omega is in fact the measure of the region where U is not zero. And here we work with the absolutely continuous part of the gradient of the SBV function. And here we have the jump set, which is intrinsically defined by the function. So I will not enter details. The advantage of this problem is that you don't, you deal only with functions in this space. And then the, the program to solve this is to prove existence of a solution that we do, we, to prove then the regularity of the solution of this uh, free boundary or free discontinuity problem. And then once you have existence and regularity, you can manage to use optimality because you are at the optimum to prove this is the ball. So this last step was rather known in different contexts, but uh, the technical part here is to prove the existence of a solution uh, and the regularity. So you have here the two approaches. And now what is our purpose? The purpose is to prove a quantitative form of the inequality, namely to prove that lambda one Q of omega minus lambda one Q of the ball is larger than a constant times the Frankel asymmetry squared. And uh, we have obtained this result in the case Q equal to with Ferron and Nietzsche and Trombetti in 2018. Uh, and at that time we said, okay, we cannot do maybe different Qs because there are two steps in the proof. And the first step was only available through the study of the H function. So what is the first step? So in the first step, we prove a sort of refined intermediate form of the inequality, which reads here. So we prove that lambda one of omega minus lambda one of the ball is larger than beta over two infimum of the first L2 normalized eigenfunction squared over the boundary times the difference of the perimeters, the perimeter of omega minus the perimeter of the ball. So this is what we do with Ferron and Nietzsche and Trombetti in the case Q, Q equal to by just working on the H function of Bosel and Danners. So we rework the proof and we get uh, this inequality, which itself is a sort of refined inequality because on the right hand side, we do not have any more zero. We have this quantity, which is definitely positive. Well, it's definitely positive, but it depends and we are not happy on the infimum of U squared. And so on the right hand side, we have a quantity which depends on omega. So we would like to have here a fixed number independent on omega, because if we have that, then we can bound from below by the isoperimetric inequality of Fusco Maggi Pratelli, the difference of the perimeters to put here the asymmet Frankel asymmetry square. But the point here is that unfortunately we have this term U square 
which depends on omega. How can we get rid of this term? There is a second step in our proof. We use the selection principle in a slightly different way. We replace omega by a set A, which has lower eigenvalue. Its Frankel asymmetry is comparable, but the infimum is controlled independently of omega. And then it's if we do this, we solve the problem because we just put a bounce on below here with lambda one of A. This term will not depend on omega. And then the asymmetry, Frankel asymmetry of omega and A are comparable by a constant. S solving this uh, auxiliary problem goes through the solving, uh, finding uh, th this A goes through solving a free discontinuity problem, which is here. We minimize among all subsets of omega, lambda one of omega plus k times the measure where k is a constant which is well chosen. So I draw here in red what could happen. So you have oscillating domain and the set A will be here. So, and we do this uh, and we solve the problem, but only in the case Q equal to because this was obtained through the H function. What can we do without the H function? And this is what I wanted to, to say. In fact, we found with, uh, with Alessandro Giacomini and Michael Naon a new energy, so which is a sort of combination between uh, the PDE and some geometry, which somehow directly gives us uh, this uh, refined form of the inequality. So first of all, uh, it's just a technical trick. We do not work with Rayleigh quotients. We work with these inline energies which are equivalent uh, to, the, to the Rayleigh quotient, as soon as Q belongs uh, to the one, is between one and two. So instead of lambda one, we work with this quantity. When we minimize them, we get lambda one via this uh, identity. So this is the classical energy that we would minimize to get uh, the, the eigenvalue. And then we introduce um, an obstacle. So we know that the function U, the first eigenfunction is positive. And we just take the same energy, the same energy is here, but we add this obstacle from below. And we observe that if the obstacle is very low, so it's positive, but very low, then the two energies are the same because this means that we didn't affect, if the obstacle is below the minimum value, we do not affect the Robin problem. And then we get, uh, we introduce a new geometric function, which is here. So we take, uh, the same energy with obstacle, but we add these terms with negative sign. So minus C square, C is the level of the obstacle. We, we put it there and minus C to power Q, which in fact uh, reads like this in an easy way. This new energy, geometric type energy, consists of the obstacle problem for Robin minus beta over two C square times the perimeter plus C Q over the times the measure. This is not important because we minimize at constant measure. So one can get rid of this. But you see here, we have the perimeter which comes into the game with negative sign. So when you minimize a quantity like this, you say, well, the perimeter comes with negative sign that may be very bad because you can make a lot of perimeter. That's true. But because we work with the obstacle problem, this u square minus c square, it will always be strictly positive or zero. In other words, a long perimeter can definitely make problems, but not very, very big problems because of the positivity of this term. And so instead of solving the original free discontinuity problem of the energy E, which would give us only that the ball is minimizer, we minimize this geometrical energy now, which is here. And what we obtain with uh, with uh, Giacomini and Noam, is that the minimizer of this geometric energy is still the ball. And the proof goes again through the machinery of free discontinuity problem. This, uh, this is a very interesting problem because you see the, on, on set, some set omega, you can have that the solution touches the obstacle and on some part is above the obstacle. The part above the obstacle is a Robin and the part which touches the obstacle, it's in fact a free boundary problem onto the level C. So we prove uh, the minimizer of this geometric energy is the ball. But in fact, the observation is that this directly gives us the refined inequality. 
because when we write optimality, the ball is better than omega, we write down what is the geometric energy. It was the obstacle energy minus beta over two C squared the perimeter. We put them here on the right hand side. So we have that the difference of the obstacle energies is larger than exactly this quantity, which is here. And now this is true for every omega and for every C. So we just look what's the best C that we can find. And the best C will be the infimum of U over omega. So that this obstacle energy becomes exactly the Robin energy, not affected by obstacle. And this leads to this uh, refined form of the inequality that you find here. And surprisingly, it's exactly the form that we got with uh, Ferron and Nietzsche and Trombetti for the first eigenvalue, but obtained by completely different uh, means. And this is uh, the theorem that we got with uh, Giacomini and Known, proving the, the quantitative form of the inequality for the range of Q between one and two, for two being already proved with uh, Ferron and Nietzsche and Trombetti. So thank you for your attention. All right, well, uh, thank you, uh, Dorin, uh, for this uh, very nice talk. This is now uh, Jean who's speaking. So does anybody have uh, any questions for uh, Dorin? Uh, uh, can I ask something very naive? Uh, so it seems like an inequality looks like the one-term expansion in the Taylor series. Uh, yes. Can you try to have an inequality or something with a two-term expansion? So the somehow the next order correction uh, in this inequality, uh, maybe for some very nice sets or something in some. Uh, I don't know, class. but you are absolutely right that this is in fact some one can see this as a two-term expansion. This kind of uh, of, uh, of inequality. And uh, this is a way in which, uh, for example, uh, Brasco, De Filippis, and Velichkov prove the inequality uh, for the Dirichlet Laplacian in the sense that as soon as you are uh, with a domain which is a graph, a C2 graph over the ball, very close to the ball, then you can write down a sort of second order expansion using the shape derivative. And this gives you the inequality. But I don't know uh, to any other inequality which would give you some extra terms. I don't know, but you are right in terms of it's indeed a sort of second order expansion. Thank you very much. All right, I have another question here from uh, Simon Larson, who asks, uh, in the construction of the sets uh, omega epsilon approximating omega with a boundary density, uh, can you deal with a density which is less than one? Uh, the addition of angles- uh, a Good question. Uh, no, we can, a priori, we cannot deal with a density which is less than one because the density we get into the limit is always greater than equal to one as we work with simply connected sets. But that's not a problem because we just rescale. We make a rescale of our domain and then we get the density larger than one. So it's a matter of rescaling only. So it's very easy. Mm -hmm. So the result, of course, is technically speaking, it's true only for densities which are one or larger than one, but from a practical point of view, we just rescale and uh, we, we do it. So, I mean, it's not domain dependent. All right. Um, are there any uh, other questions for- uh, uh, Yes, this is uh, Philippe. Do you guys hear me? Yes, we yeah. hear you. Okay, so I had the two questions for the, the sets uh, Omega Epsilon. So the first thing is that you f you sort of fold the set omega like uh, an accordion to sort of re reshape the way that the length is on the boundary. So um, we, is, we we do not change omega. So omega is fixed. We have theta over omega. So what we do with the oscillation, we try only to reproduce length, which into the limit gives the value theta. So we do not force in any way omega. Omega is fixed. So our oscillation is there only to produce in terms of length, the accumulation, which is equal to theta onto the boundary. Yes. That's all. Okay, yes. So, um, so my question was, when you, when you add these oscillations, do you need to have corners? Like, would you, 
be able to perturb no 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 so we do it way. no my draw was only to as an example we do it in a smooth way okay yeah. um so that's the first question now the second question is um so when you um when you perturb the uh, no, sorry when you um when you consider the minimal c that or the maximum c that you found in your last uh, part so when you're saying that all the Robin yeah. eigenvalue uh, eigenfunctions are up strictly above zero on the boundary yeah. so when you have this expression for uh, the difference between the um, geometric energy with the obstacle and the geometric energy so it should be zero when c is small enough and then yes yes and then if it c will is below to... yeah absolutely when c is below the the minimal value of u the yes. obstacle energy equals to the classical energy well the geometric part contains this uh, perimeter part yes so um so when you uh, try to express this or you try to, uh, to let's say uh, calculate the derivatives in terms of c does that give you any information on the function u or not really because uh, this should so. be flat and then it starts to, to grow or I, I can't remember what the sign is, but um. So, I mean, U is depending on, on the geometry of Omega yes. in a very wild way. I, we do not really know. We tried to understand a little bit okay, how okay. it works. So in, if I have a lot of oscillations somehow accumulating around one point, then U, I can uh, do it as low as I want. So, I mean, we do not have any information between, uh, so, so in, in fact, this inequality with the infimum here, the infimum may be all, even zero, even zero. <coughs> so, I mean, yeah. So, but this is a, a crucial step in order to, to prove the quantitative form of inequality because this is the step which allows us to go to the auxiliary free discontinuity problem. So itself, this inequality, an inequality like this uh, could be interesting, for instance, in the class of convex sets, because if you work with convex sets, this infimum, you can prove it's bounded uh, from below uh -huh. in a right, uniform okay. way. I, um, thanks, uh, Philip, for the questions. We have another question from uh, uh, Simon Larson again. Uh, the question being, um, for the instability of the Steklov eigenvalue problem, uh, how much does the error in the convergence of the eigenvalues of the disk depend on the number of the eigenvalue? Uh, for example, whether it's sigma k rather than sigma 1. Uh, could you, for instance, say that the question we, we thought a little bit to it, we don't know. So we don't know what is the rate of convergence. So mm -hmm. well, we, we thought a little bit, we don't, we don't, we cannot manage. So for instance, we, we cannot know if we have, we can get kind of uniformity of kind of control depending mm -hmm. on K, we don't know. I, I know that in, uh, in, in the homogenization setup that we have, uh, we, we have uh, made uh, with, with the holes instead of the perturb boundary perturbation, we definitely do not have uniformity in K. Probably so this, we I mean, don't have either here, probably. But this, our convergence is not that bad because you have this uniform cone condition, which is quite strong. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it's yeah. quite strong. But yeah. I, I don't know. So I, I, well, I don't have uh, neither yes nor no, but maybe it's no. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, are there any uh, other questions for, uh, for Darim? Uh, this is Asma speaking. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Uh, okay, so I have a question again about this uh, omega epsilon perturbation. So you prove Weinstein inequality for convex domain in higher dimension. And we, uh, we know that it's not true in higher dimension, even for ball, if we put different metric by result of perturbation. Yeah. But I wonder this kind of perturbation. So I see that there is some aspect of that is two dimensional, but uh, I wonder if you can do it in higher dimension. Like uh, to show that it's unstable. I mean, yes, definitely, definitely. I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, this, so the perturbation result is not two dimensional. Yeah. So, I mean, you can build 
also uh, uniform cone condition in higher dimension, but I mean, I'm sure, probably. <laughs> so I have to, to, one has to write it carefully. Yeah, probably it's true. Okay, thank you. Uh, are there um, any other yeah, questions? Here's uh, Alex, just uh, that in, in two dimension, don't you use the, the fact that the Dirichlet energy is conformally invariant in your proofs? Uh, in no, which step? In, in, into the perturbation result, we don't use, use it. I mean, for me, the perturbation result says that if you have omega and you have uh, an oscillating uh, domain with a uniform cone condition, roughly speaking, you get uh, convergence of the eigenvalues towards the density problem where density is the accumulation of the perimeter. I think this is true independently of the dimension. Is, yeah, this okay. is my guess. Thank you. All right. Any, uh, say, a last question? Maybe we have time. Well, if not, uh, thank you, Darren, uh, for the very nice talk and for uh, all the thank discussions you. that uh, this has sparked. Thank you. And uh, thanks again. <laughs>